beautiful, yeah? How does it feel to celebrate the Chinese New Year and the Winter Olympic Games at the same time? It's certainly an occasion which merits a special venue. That's why I'm welcoming you from the Sima Tai Great Wall, 120 kilometers north of Beijing. Today, I'm going to bring you my exclusive interviews with representatives of three international winter sports federations and four volunteers to the Games. What are their expectations? How are they celebrating this special occasion? Let's find out. Let's start with skating, one of the main disciplines of Winter Olympic Games. And 12 of China's 13 Winter Olympic goals come from this sport. Earlier, I talked to Jan Dijkema, president of the International Skating Union, to find out what he looks forward to during Beijing 2022 skating events. Mr. Dakama, thank you very much for joining us uh, at this very special moment. So skating is a major part of the Winter Olympic Games and um, figure skating, speed skating, short track skating, they're all fantastic uh, competitions. Uh, as the president of the International Skating Union, you will personally be in Beijing. What are your expectations for these games? First of all, of course, like always with the Olympic Games, we will have exciting competitions and, and many, many uh, memorable uh, moments, I'm sure. But this time we also have a challenge uh, because we have the pandemic. So uh, this will be a bit different. And of course, uh, for the organization, it's a challenge. It's uh, also for uh, the International Skating Union, IOC, is a challenge. Uh, but we hope, because everybody is doing the utmost to, to, uh, to avoid infections. So I hope it will not uh, disturb the games. So uh, as usual, we will have fantastic uh, competitions. And uh, of course, the games will be a great uh, challenge, a great uh, legacy also for China. So uh, I'm looking forward to these games. It will be, will be fantastic again with really amazing uh, venues. So I'm really looking forward to it. You were talking about the venues and uh, Beijing has been uh, smart, let's say, with the use of venues. For instance, the indoor stadium of the capital was used for the 20, 2008 volleyball games during the Beijing Summer Olympic Games, and now it's repurposed for figure skating and short track speed skating. So what do you think of the repurpose of the venue, and uh, how do you think this can advance the, the, the idea and the spirit of uh, sustainability? Yeah, right. I must say that the, both the uh, Capital Indoor Stadium and the Ice Ribbon for long track speed skating are uh, The Capital Indoor Stadium we know since many years, it's now renovated, it's a fantastic uh, venue after the renovation. We had a test event for short track, speed skating was very well done. And uh, we had also the Grand Prix uh, event for figure skating at the Capital Indoor Stadium. So I'm really confident that this will be a, a fantastic look during the, uh, during the games. And also for the, for the Ice Ribbon, the long track speed skating is the brand new venue. And both stadiums are, uh, are uh, for the ice making, uh, doing a job very, in a very sustainable way because they, they left uh, ammonia using carbon dioxide. So this will mean a sustain, sustainable way of making us. And uh, to give a figure, it means during the games that you that the, the reduction of ammonia, ammonia is uh, like planting for more than one million trees. So this is proving that uh, the the both stadiums are doing a job in a really sustainable way. 
Let's talk about some of the famous names because a good games are also about recognized people and uh, some of the stars. For instance, uh, uh, Utsuru Hanyu from Japan, Kim Yuna from the Republic of Korea, of course, Shen Xue and Jia Hongbo are the best known figure skaters. Why do you think figure skating is so attractive and uh, so looked? You know, looked up to by so many people, and how do you think they can use their name recognition to help promote winter sports? Uh, yeah, figure skating always has been a very, very, very popular sport worldwide, and uh, that's why also when you are a champion in figure skating worldwide, you are you are really a, a big star. And this is also for the Chinese, of course, uh, historically very strong in pair skating. Uh, so this is the reason why the figure skaters uh, are well known and popular because the sport is popular because it is an amazing combination of athletics, athletic and art, and uh, which is unique. And that's why uh, figure skating is a very popular sport, sport worldwide, one of the biggest sports in the world. Mm. And uh, China, although the history of Chinese skating dates back, but the competition, you know, China taking part in winter Olympic competition has not been that long. But China has done fairly well. For instance, 12 of China's Olympic winter golds come from skating. So how do you assess China's performance so far in uh, skating? And uh, uh, why do you think Chan has been able to achieve the edge in skating in such a short period of time? Uh, you, you are right. Uh, China is a powerhouse in short track. And historically, also in uh, figure skating, in pair skating, especially in pair skating. Uh, so this, this is, this is uh, for sure and no doubt uh, a great history for China. Yang Yang, for example, is... is, is is really a great, great uh, example for uh, the history of China regarding short track uh, skating. And I must say the highest facilities for skating in China are the best uh, reason to, to clarify why China is so strong. So I hope this will uh, continue, of course, in the future. And I have no doubt this will do so. Thank you so much, Mr. Yang Dai Kumar, President of the International Skating Union, for joining us from Tobogan, the Netherlands. And I wish you a wonderful stay in Beijing. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing you in Beijing and a happy new year and a happy new year of the tiger for Thank you all. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Another sport that Beijing embraced enthusiastically is curling, considered chess on ice. And curling event is a trailblazer for Beijing 2022, as it will start two days ahead of the Games. I talked to the World Curling Federation, Kate Caitness, joining me from Scotland. Kate. Thank you very much for joining us from Perth, Scotland. It's a great honor to have you on the show. So let's talk about the upcoming Beijing 2022. I'm sure people have been making preparations for it. So help us understand what kind of preparation your federation has been making, uh, your understanding of the kind of preparations the athletes have been making from Scotland, for instance, or elsewhere. Remember, Scotland is Great Britain. When, 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 when Scotland um, participates, it's Great Britain. Um, no, the preparations are going well since, since um, they got the bid seven years ago, as when um, uh, Beijing won the bid uh, against Almaty. Um, so we've, we've been working with the, the Chinese Winter Sport Federation and, of course, BOCOL, the Beijing Organising Committee. I'm actually on the IOC Coordination Commission for the Games as well, so I'm on to represent not only curling, but all winter sports. And to see the progress that's been made in, in Beijing um, over the period has been fantastic. And I know that your president, your, your president, Xi Jinping, um, wanted 300 million people to participate in winter sports um, on their run up to the games. And with this in mind, he's, they've done a fantastic job. I mean, the, what's happened, and in my particular uh, case, 500 ice rinks have been built throughout China. So um, we're very excited. The Olympics, of the, the, the athletes, of course, they have been preparing oh, for four years. 
for this is their big moment, mm -hmm. and um, which and some are already I think are en route as we speak, going to holding camps round about um, uh, China to get acclimatised to the time difference. So they'll all be preparing. We start off two days before the, the games with mixed doubles. Um, so that starts on the 2nd of February. And of course, the opening ceremony is the 4th. And then thereafter, we have the men's and women's, uh, which is a four-team event. Yeah, you have uh, the whole world's attention on the curling events <laughs> in the upcoming days. But uh, it's very interesting. I, I know you visited uh, the uh, Aquatic Center, the National Aquatic Center in Beijing, which was turned from a water cube into an ice cube to host the winter sports games and one of the sports that's going to be played out in there is curling. Uh, what do you think of the transformation? I understand the requirement is very harsh huh, for curling competition. Of course it is. I mean, I don't think people, people think ice is ice. Well, it's not. We have um, soft ices for hockey, ice skating. Curling has to be hard ice. It has to be totally level. It has to stay the same temperature throughout the whole game, which lasts for almost three hours. Uh, each game, we have three draws per day. Um, we have more TV coverage, coverage than any other sport because we start our TV coverage at 9 a.m. and it, fin it finishes at 10 p.m every single day right up till the very end and mm. so our sport has wild uh, wild worldwide appeal mm. but what do you think of the transformation oh, uh, sorry one one last thing i should have said that 2008 i was in uh, beijing for the paralympic summer games and i presented uh, at one of the presentations in the water cube for swimming so this is going to be very unique for me because here we are now when it was now turned to ice, the, the, the water cube is now called the ice cube and once more I'll be doing presentations. So for me this is very unique. I have to tell you they have done an outstanding job in transforming the, the, the facility because as you can understand they've had to build up the a level to, to uh, level and then thereafter has to be totally stable it cannot move it must be totally stable they've done an outstanding job we had our test event there in october i was out for the whole of the test event uh, last year and i'm very very happy the facility is outstanding and very excited about again your fascination with china with you actually taught right in uh, beijing sports university in 2016 and you were Dean of the Curling College of the University. So what motivated to come to China and take up these roles and what um, impression you had about Chinese curling education or sports education in general? I think China is, is I, I love the traditions of China. Um, China is very, very close to my heart. I love the country and I was very um, honored to be, um, become the honorary professor of Beijing Sport University, and then thereafter to be the dean of the curling uh, academy. But uh, no, the sport, and, and I mean, in, in the short life that, that uh, Chinese curling, China, China has been involved with the World Curling Federation, they've done an outstanding job. You know, way back in 2009, only 10 years after they become me became members, your World Women's, and uh, the World Women's Championships, uh, Chinese uh, Betty Wang, um, won the, the World Championship. So there's a great history of, of uh, what's happened within China. Um, how the, the Chinese teams are progressing at this moment in time, I'm not sure, because we haven't seen too much of them on the international stage over the last period because of they've been training at home. And I know they've been working extremely hard. And Per Lindholm, who is the, the performance coach, who um, was a, the performance coach of the um, and sweet from Sweden, the Swedish teams, both Annette Norberg and um, uh, Nicholas Eden. He has he so he comes with a great history of of curling. So he's the best coach that you could possibly have at this moment in time because of the history he's had with the Olympics. So. I'm really looking forward to seeing you, both your Chinese mixed doubles, men's and women's teams performing and see, hopefully we'll see them on the podium. Skiing has a history in China longer than most people think. A cave painting found in northwest China dating back 10,000 to 30,000 years ago shows hunters on skis. And last year, China recorded some 20 million skier visits, one of the largest in the world. 
Earlier, I talked to Peter Girdle, Chief Race Director for Alpine Women at the International Ski Federation, to find out what he thinks of the stepped-up Chinese enthusiasm for skiing and what to expect during this year's skiing events. Mr. Girdle, thank you very much for joining us. How would you describe the facilities uh, that, are, that are getting ready to receive athletes because alpine skiing is a very demanding sport. It's also potentially uh, very dangerous if the slope, if the facility is not good enough, uh, according to my understanding. How would you rate the kind of uh, facilities that are being made available for international sports men and women? No, I would say this uh, downhill slope is a demanding one. Uh, but on the same time, uh, we've put uh, together with the, with the course designer uh, all the necessary security and safety installations on both sides. It means that, of course, it's demanding. Of course, it's in some sections quite steep, uh, which will make uh, the race then and the competition even more interesting, actually. Uh, but on the same time, uh, all the safety installations uh, are on place. I've seen uh, some uh, some photos from the last uh, two weeks, so everything is on place at the moment. Uh, the same we can say also for the tech events, so the other slope, we have actually two slopes uh, where we will compete. And even this one is uh, perfectly organized with all the installation that we need to uh, in order to have the races as safe as possible and to offer, of course, to the athletes uh, the best possible uh, environment to compete uh, at their top level. Tell us a little bit more about how you feel and what kind of preparations have you put into making this uh, a successful experience and uh, your expectations for the Games here in Beijing? Well, of course, the expectations are high. I would, I, I, I'm excited to be there and to start uh, run these races. Uh, I must say that we had a very good cooperation in the last three, four years uh, with BOKOK, with the organizing committee there, and of course with the IOC, uh, in order to prepare this in the best possible way. Um, what is maybe a little bit missing was the, the fact that we could not have the proper test events because of the pandemic. So this was canceled uh, in the last two seasons. Uh, but at the same time, I know that, uh, and we have seen the footage uh, that the Chinese uh, National Ski Association organized some national races. Uh, and we have seen the footage of these races. So we have a, quite an idea how this can work then during the race time. So at the end, I'm quite confident. How are the athletes feeling about this? You work in the you know, um, Ski Federation. You must talk to athletes from around the world all the time. What are their expectations, uh, maybe also their concerns? And uh, have you communicated with them? What are their thoughts? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, it's clear that uh, all of the athletes are excited to the Olympics, as always happened. I mean, this is nothing new there. The athletes really want to compete in the Olympics. Uh, uh, on the other side, the concerns are only because they didn't have the possibility to, to ski there before and to have some the test events, as I mentioned before. Uh, but this footage that was provided and all the information that were provided, the athletes have kind of, let's say, online information that they got it. And uh, of course, this is not the same as skiing there, but it's helping them to be prepared. And on the other side, we uh, scheduled quite some training days and testing days before the start of the race itself. So at the end, I guess that we will have enough time when we arrive or when the athletes arrive to Yanqing to test the course and to ski on it and to make familiar make themselves familiar with the, with the environment. Yeah. Well, on the other hand, as I said, more and more Chinese are um, getting more familiar with skiing, including alpine skiing, and uh, they're learning about it as well. Uh, I know I am, for, you know, I'm not for alpine skiing. <laughs> I get very dizzy. I lose control. <laughs> and, uh, but I know it's great fun. And uh, you have specialized as an Alpine race director. So what's the key, let's say, to the success in this event, both for individual players and for a country such as China? How can Chinese teams do better? 
Well, they have a, a, the National Ski Association in China uh, put up a very concrete and, and, and uh, detailed plan how to develop uh, young athletes. Uh, I know they have some uh, uh, coaches from Europe, from some uh, like Austria or Italy uh, working there and helping the younger Chinese athletes to develop and to reach the level, uh, let's say the World Cup level. Uh, some of them made it already, so we will have uh, Chinese athletes at the start uh, in, uh, at the Olympics and uh, because they trained uh, a lot even here in Europe, both in Europe as well as in China. And uh, I think that they will be able to compete, uh, maybe not on the top, top level, but still to able to compete uh, with, the, with the athletes from the other nations. So I am confident. And of course, this is a start. Then in the next years, this will probably develop even better. And I'm quite sure that we'll have some soon some uh, Chinese athletes on the World Cup level as well. Many thanks to Peter Gödel, Chief Race Director of Alpine Women at the International Ski Federation, joining us from Switzerland. Another group of important players are the volunteers for the Games. They don't get the spotlight as uh, the athletes, but they're indispensable for the game's success. I talked to four volunteers from Tsinghua University to find out why they're volunteering and how is Beijing 2022 inspiring them. Wang Zixi, Zhao Jessica Huiting, Temeliti Yulia, and Zhang Junying, the warmest welcome to all of you. Yulia, let us start with you. I know you came to live in China in 2012. That's almost a decade. And I'm told you speak very fluent Chinese. And you will be on the reception team in the International Liaison Group of Beijing 2022. What does that mean? And uh, what kind of training have you been receiving for that? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Yulia from Russia and currently studying at Tsinghua University. I'm actually a language service volunteer, uh, specifically during the opening and closing ceremony. Uh, we're going to be in charge of the translation for the foreigners during these two ceremonies and in charge of guiding them through the whole ceremony. So we've already done a lot of practicing. Uh, such as ICANN platform study, EF training, and a lot of other stuff, uh, especially some professional lectures, not about our professional knowledges, but also, also for safety, uh, since the COVID is also outside the world. So we need to learn how to keep uh, yourself safe first and then how to work. Wang Zixi, let me hear your story. You are uh, a veteran, let's say. You volunteered already at the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics in the Republic of Korea. So what made you want to volunteer for those games in the first place? Hi, everyone. I'm Wang Zixi, and I'm at Tsinghua University right now. Um, actually, the thought of becoming a volunteer in 2018 wasn't, wasn't spontaneous. Uh, actually, after 2008, uh, Beijing held its uh, Summer Olympic. I thought I always want to be a volunteer for this such an international event. And actually, so uh, in 2018, I'm finally qualified to be an international volunteer because I'm, uh, I'm older than 18 years old. Wow. So, what kind um, of qualifications do you need? Um, I need some experience of volunteering and I have to be older than 18 years old and I need to speak more than, it, it is better to speak more than one languages actually. So um, I am confident enough and so I applied and I'm very fortunate to be enrolled in that. Uh, Zhao Huiting, uh, let me come to you. You grew up and study in both China and the United States. So what do you consider to be your advantage in terms of uh, volunteering work? 
Well, I'm really fortunate to have both lived and studied in both countries. So I really got to really experience two very different cultures, one that's more collectivistic and the other more individualistic. And that really made me gain the skill of cross-cultural communication in addition to being able to use both languages. Um, and so I'm looking forward to really using that skill in my volunteering services and facilitating some meaningful and open conversations across different cultures and making sure that we're setting a foundation for a more harmonious relationship rather than a competitive one. Mm. Finally, um, Zhang, why do you want to volunteer? And what specifically would you do as a volunteer instead of an architect, design, a designer? Well, um, the, the Chinese old saying is that if the good thing, you can make it double, right? Uh, I happen to be the volunteer uh, for the Summer Olympic. Um, but this time it's the Winter Olympic, uh, I would like to try again. And I'm lucky enough to be enrolled. And I'm currently working in a team of personnel management. It's uh, more like the uh, human resource team. Uh, we take care of all the people who work inside this uh, national stadium. I see. The most important Chinese holiday, the Spring Festival, is uh, almost uh, happening simultaneously with the Winter Olympic Games. So how are you going to celebrate your Spring Festival? If you have to go into the loop or if you don't have to go into the loop? Um, I'm currently working inside the National Stadium. Um, uh, in the stadium, it's mainly so it's for the opening ceremony and the closing ceremony. And in this stadium, uh, we clearly define so-called the closed loop and the area, not the closed loop. So as long as I'm uh, assigned to work outside the closed loop, I can enjoy my uh, spring festival free and together maybe uh, enjoy it with uh, my friends and family. Mm. Yulia, Yulia, what, would, uh, what is your plan? I mean, you've been in China for so long. Spring festival is a special time. So will you do something? What would you do? Uh, actually, we're going to spend, probably we're going to spend the uh, Spring Festival in a hotel with uh, our others volunteers. So actually, Tsinghua provided us with a, he, um, a program, probably. We're going to have a dinner together. We're going to have some, uh, some kind of a games, just not to keep us really bored on this uh, celebration. And probably I'm just going to call my parents, uh, say that this is a huge festival in China. And I hope that some kind of a happy mood can keep me safe and uh, related to our family. Thank you so much for your commitment to help make this Olympic Games a great success and uh, joyful experience for people around the world. And all all the best wishes to you. With that, we come to the end of this special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin, coming to you from the Sima Tai Great Wall, north of Beijing. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Li Xin in Beijing. Thanks for watching. You've got the point, and happy Year of the Tiger.